Hi guys, we are discussing the Artha Shastra and today we start daily life in the Cotillion Times. And it has some sub chapters like the rich and the poor, city life, village life, etc. We'll get to them. So daily life, starting with the rich and the poor. There was tremendous disparity in wealth. Apart from the king whose wealth was all the surplus wealth of the state, there were high officials earning 48,000 pun a year, not counting the pre uh, uh, perquisites of office like today's bureaucrats. Even if we ignore ascetics and mendicant monks uh, as being poor by choice, the lowest government salary was only 60 pun a year, making the ratio of the highest to the lowest paid 800 to 1. For the value of a pun, uh, see a uh, future chapter which we will get to in some later videos. The lower monetary fine was one eighth of a pun for making a public road impassable with dirt, water or mud and the highest 5,000 pun levied on a courtesan, courtesan disobeying an order to attend on someone, a ratio of 4,000 to 1. Grazing charges in a village for sheep and goats were only 1 16th of a pun a day. At the other extreme, as the detailed regulations show, <coughs> many private citizens could afford to pay goldsmiths and uh, silversmiths. The rich were naturally the targets whenever the king needed additional resources in times of emergency. The king could ask them to give gold voluntarily or sell them honors. Now city life. Though urban life is tackled in the Arthashastra only in the form of punishments for violations of rules and regulations, we get from these a picture of how people lived inside the fortified city. The rules on precautions against fire show that fire was a major hazard in a densely packed city. Craftsmen like smiths who worked with fire were concentrated in a separate quarter of the, city, of the city. Maintenance of cleanliness, sanitation and hygiene was a part of house building regulations. So was privacy. See how advanced that society was. The people were expected to contribute to building common facilities, not obstruct their use nor destroy them. Causing harm to an entire neighborhood attracted a fine of 48 pun, like getting their houses bulldozed today. The sale of houses and tenancy were strictly regulated. The duties and fees of artisans, goldsmiths, silversmiths and even washermen were clearly fixed. The governor general of the city was responsible for the maintenance of law and order, which included control of lodgings, curfew and movement control, and prevention of crime. Under him, there were four divisional officers, one for each quarter of the city. Record keepers kept a record of every person in a section of the city which, with details including their income and expenditure. Now we come to village life. While the governor general was responsible for administering the more compact city, the chancellor, and had to, the chancellor had to administer the whole of the vast countryside with its villages, pastures, empty tracts and forests. Though the chancellor also had under him governors of provinces and record keepers, his control would have been much looser. He relied much more on the secret service. A lot of responsibility therefore fell on the Gramika, the village headman, and the Gramavridha, the village elders. <clears throat> it's so interesting that 2300 years later, I can read a, sent a word directly used by Chanakya in those times and understand the meaning. Gramavridha. Any Indian who knows any Indian language should know this. In Bengali, we would just pronounce it as Gramvridha. Grama Vridha. The elders were responsible for looking. Uh, the elders were responsible for looking after temple property, holding in trust a minor's property until he came of age, arbitrating disputes regarding fields, and overseeing the sale of immovable property. A debtor, one who has debt, a debtor could redeem his pledge by depositing the money owed by him with the elders, even if the actual creditor was absent. The village headman was responsible for maintenance of the village boundary pillars, controlling grazing and ejecting undesirables. He could also give, uh, he could also give asylum to a woman who had run away from home. See how progressive the, uh, the, see how progressive the, the society was. Each villager had to take his turn in accompanying the headman whenever he went on official business. So uh, they could give asylum to a woman who had run away from home, but people think that India was all about uh, Brahminical patriarchy. 
Usually everyone in the village had to contribute his share of the cost of common projects, festivals and entertainments. However, those belonging to a family, caste, group or locality were not obliged to take part in festivities if they did not want to do so. Now, quoting from Chanakya's words itself, the people of a village shall obey the orders of anyone who proposes any activity beneficial to all. 100 pun was the fine for both failing to help a neighbor and conversely interfering without reason in the affairs of a neighbor. Now, eating habits. The average food consumption can be deduced from the ration prescribed for an Arya male for one meal. One prastha, about a kilo of rice, a quarter of a liter of broth, one sixteenth of a liter of uh, butter or oil and a bit of salt. Attendants of elephants were given a liter of boiled rice, a cupful of oil, 160 grams of sugar, 800 grams of meat and salt, uh, 800 grams of meat and salt. An annual salary of 16 pern is said to be equivalent to one adhaka or four prasthas of grain a day, enough for four meals. Using the average of the conversion factors suggested by various scholars and assuming that payment was made according to the payment measure, 12.5% uh, smaller than the revenue measure, this will very approximately be, equi be equivalent to 4 litres or between 3 to 3.5 three kilos of grain per person per day. If we assume that the grain was unprocessed, the quantity of dehusked and milled grain would have been between 1.5 to 2.5 kilos per person per day. We must note that the ration suggested for an Arya male was the highest. The lower classes got the same quantity of rice and salt but only two-third of the quantity of broth and, of, and half the oil given to the Arya male. Women received three quarters uh, and chil uh, <coughs> women received three quarters and uh, children half the, the quantities uh, for the corresponding male of their category. It is clear from the punishment prescribed for making someone from a higher varna eat or drink a prohibited item that there were food taboos. Presumably the taboos were as prescribed in the Dharma Shastras. It is not clear why elephant doctors unlike other attendants were not given meat. A wide variety of commodities were used for cooking. Different kinds of rice, other cereals like wheat, barley and millets, a variety of beans and lentils, butter and ghee, vegetable oils from sesame and mustard, sugar, honey, uh, treacle and molasses, vinegars, fruit juices from tamarind, lemon and pomegranate, milk and yogurt, spices including pepper, ginger, coriander, cumin seed, and anise, anise, I don't know what that is, A-N-I-S-E, root vegetables, other vegetables and fruit, fresh and dried meat and dried fish. The quantities of other ingredients for cooking fresh meat are given as follows. For every kilo of meat, 50 grams of salt, 50 grams of sugar, 10 grams spices, one and a quarter kilo of yogurt, and a small quantity of oil. For dried meat, the above quantities were doubled and for vegetables, one and a half times the above quantities were used. Kautilya, give, uh, Kautilya even gives the amount of firewood required for cooking a prastha of rice as 25 palas. We know of the existence of public eating houses where different kinds of cooked food was sold, restaurants because secret agents often disguise themselves as food vendors <laughs> for example as the agents of, uh, as the, for example as the agents of the chancellor for liberating hostages and for poisoning enemy troops <coughs> that's why they had to dress up as restauranters in the city such places were periodically searched for undesirables and the owners were prohibited from giving lodgings to strangers there were separate vegetarian and non-vegetarian eating eating places bakers selling bread sweetmeat sellers and broth makers. The chief superintendent of warehouses disposed of broken grains left over from the milling grain by selling them to broth makers and cooked food vendors. Now, dress and decoration. While we do not know what kind of dresses people wore, we have many indications of what the garments were made of. Cotton, wool, bark fibers, silk cotton, hemp and flax were used to spin yarn of different qualities. Uh, a spin yarn of different qualities, coarse, medium and fine. Skins and furs were used for garments. Details of the production of various types of fabrics are given later, given later under the textile industry, which we will come to later. Uh, people wore a, a variety of jewellery made of gold set with pearls and precious stones on their heads, hands, feet and waists. 
Cotillia goes into great detail in classifying and indicating the source of sources of diamonds, rubies and other precious stones and naming different types of pearl necklaces. Perfumes, particularly sandal and aloe, were often used. They were considered to be articles of high value along with gold and precious stones. Cotillia gives a detailed, um, a detailed account of the quality of the perfumes and their sources of supply. Garlands of flowers were worn as a decoration. The king had, among his attendants, shampooers, bath preparers and garland makers. Every courtesan had to be accomplished in shampooing and the preparation of perfumes and garlands. Now we come to leisure activities. There is a great deal of material in the Arthashastra about how the people spend their leisure and entertain themselves. These leisure activities fall into three broad groups. Private entertainment, public entertainment, uh, like shows and performances and... Okay, there's a spelling mistake here. There's a typo. Uh, brought into three broad groups. Private entertainment, public ent entertainment, like shows and performance performances and strictly controlled activities like gambling, drinking and prostitution. Private entertainment. Remember that these were controlled, strictly controlled but not illegal. Gambling, drinking, prostitution, everything. Private entertainment. It was normal to throw a feat on uh, ceremonial or, or auspicious occasions like births and marriages. <coughs> Anyone giving a large feast was asked to make special drainage arrangements for washing. <laughs> the king himself, duly protected, attended such feasts. Such occasions when people's attention was otherwise engaged was also used for nefarious purposes such as entrapping a suspected minister or to obtain money during emergencies and to storm a fort. Hunting was a pastime of the rich, particularly the royal family. However, inordinate addiction to hunting was considered as one of the four serious vices, the others being gambling, drinking and womanizing. But Cotillia, after extensive analysis, concludes that it is the least serious of the four. From the reference to betting being allowed in events involving skill or learning, we may deduce that competitions such as archery were held. Painting and recitation are referred to among the arts. Painting and recitations, 2300 years ago, 2300 years ago. Now public entertainment. There is a long list of professional entertainers in the Arthashastra. Actors, dancers, musicians, mimics, reciters, storytellers, acrobats, jugglers and conjurers. There were shows during the day and at night. Uh, from the differential punishments prescribed for a wife attending a show without the consent of her husband, we see that some shows were entirely by female performers and others only by males. The cost of putting on shows was shared by the people of a village. Foreign entertainers paid a special tax. To prevent the attention of the people in new settlements being diverted from work, no buildings were to be erected for lodging entertainers, who were enjoined not to obstruct the work. Perhaps for the same reason, entertainers were prohibited from moving from village to village during the monsoon. Entertainers were permitted to make fun of the customs of the, relig of the region, castes or families and the... Okay, re listen to this. Entertainers were permitted to make fun of the customs of the region, castes or families and the practices and love affairs of individuals. However, they were advised not to praise excessively anyone in return for large gifts. As in other instances when people's attention was diverted, shows could also afford an opportunity to draw out the enemy from the safety of his fort or for storming it. Now, Gambling and Betting Betting and gambling was strictly controlled by the state. Gambling is described as wagering with inanimate objects with, uh, such as dice. Betting appears to have involved challenges and was concerned with cockfights, animal races and similar contests. Placing bets on literary or artistic challenges was not covered by the regulations. Since Cotillia considered that all gamblers were cheats by nature, his regulations contained stiff punishments for cheating. In order to ensure that gambling was conducted under controlled conditions, playing in places other than the authorized gambling halls was prohibited. The penalty for gambling elsewhere, the penalty for gambling elsewhere was the most common fine of 12 pun. Gambling halls were managed by gambling masters, like our casinos, who were responsible for providing true undoctored gambling equipment, accommodation and water, exactly like a Las Vegas casino. They could collect an entrance fee, higher charges for the 
<coughs> higher charges for the equipment and charges for their expenses since betting beyond their means is common among gamblers the masters were also permitted to accept articles as pledges and sell them if not redeemed the master could be punished for hiring out loaded dice or false equipment cheating the customer and cheating the government of revenue the state got its revenue from a tax of 5% levied on all winning as well as the fines collected by the chief controller of gambling and betting there is an interesting contrast between the punishments described uh, prescribed for the same offense if it is committed by the gambling master or by the client for cheating with loaded dice sleight of hand and other such tricks the master was fined the lowest standard penalty and his winnings were confiscated but the punishment for a gambler was cutting off his hand he could avoid that only by paying a fine of 400 pun alcoholic beverages the manufacture and sale of alcoholic drinks was a state monopoly private manufacturing being very limited and strictly controlled alcoholic drinks were widely sold in many places in the city the countryside and the camps okay and the alcoholic drinks were widely sold in many places in the city the countryside and the camps these were drunk mainly in drinking halls but built these were drunk mainly in drinking halls built for this purpose so like bars the arthashastra prescribes now quoting janakya himself these shall have many rooms with beds and seats in separate places the drinking rooms shall be made pleasant in all seasons by providing them with perfumes flowers and water the quote ends only persons of good character could buy and take away small quantities of liquor only persons of good quantity could take this away to their home or drink elsewhere not elsewhere in their home at least others had to drink it on the premises moving about while drunk was prohibited the liquor seller employed beautiful female servants who were used to find out who were used to find out information about customers who might have been imposters so it's just like a bar the duties and responsibilities of the chief controller of alcoholic beverages uh, may be seen later in later chapters details of the types of liquor made are given in appendix 10 the prevalence for drinking gave rise to opportunities for poisoning with narcotics or stupefiants during a fight between the chiefs of oligarchies instigated by the king or for disabling the enemy's troops during a siege <coughs> 